Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Parenting in Serious Mental Illness, Partnering as Parents to Encourage Hope. I would like to remind you all that if there's time at the end of this presentation, we will open up for questions. And so if you're attending in Zoom, you can ask in the chat box or the Q&A box down on the bottom of the screen. Or if you're joining on Facebook Live, you can just leave a comment. So our presenters today are Dr. Joanne Nicholson and Dr. Ann Whitman. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'm Joanne Nicholson, and I am happy to be here today with my friend and colleague, Ann Whitman. Uh, just briefly about myself, I am the mother of four um, and a psychologist by training. And um, I'm on the faculty as a professor at Brandeis University and have spent my, the bulk of my career um, learning about and with parents who live with mental health conditions. Anne. Hi, I'm Ann Whitman and I'm the parent of a 36 year old daughter who's an independent licensed social worker uh, practicing in Western Mass. I prefer the city. She prefers the country. Um, Can I'm you also tell we're proud. <laughs> what? Can you tell we're proud? Yeah, okay. we're proud parents. <laughs> um, so, anyways, I'm a person with lived experience with mental health and substance misuse challenges. Um, I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder with psychotic features. Um, so, this topic is of special interest to me. With the uh, International Bipolar Foundation, and uh, just want to thank you for inviting us. Um, exactly. I also work with a team of uh, six peer specialists at the Center for Psychosocial and Systemic Research uh, at Mass General Hospital, and we have been charged with developing peer-led, peer-designed, and peer-executed um, research projects and quality improvement projects um, to improve the lives of those with mental health challenges and substance use. Great. I do want to acknowledge that our work has multiple funders, um, the National Institute for Disability, the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health has been a key partner of ours for many years, um, and want to just make sure that uh, you understand that the statements and conclusions in this presentation are ours and we're not representing the federal government or anything. <laughs> and uh, we each come from a different center. Uh, my center at Brandeis is the National Research Center for Parents with Disabilities. Um, and psychiatric disability is certainly among those disabilities uh, we construe as our focus. And Anne, you've already mentioned the Center of Excellence at Mass General. Do you want to say anything more about that center or? Um, yeah, it's funded also by the Department of Mental Health. It's a brand new uh, center. It's two years old. And aside from improving the lives of uh, and recovery processes of individuals with mental health challenges, um, one of its missions is to partner with communities in all phases of um, research and that's one of the reasons we've hired the peer consultants because they have um, such great connections with local communities across the state of Massachusetts. Exactly. We have a, a number of objectives today. The first of course is to give parents voice, um, something that doesn't always happen and so we're happy to have the opportunity and thanks to the foundation for giving us the opportunity to do that. In the process, we're going to identify some key issues and challenges for parents to suggest some ways to meet those challenges and uh, to focus on what's strong and what's not wrong. Uh, because so many times, particularly in our mental health system, uh, providers focus on what's not working right rather than what's working well. And so we're going to take advantage of this opportunity to talk about parents' strengths uh, as well as some of their needs and challenges. Why do we care about parenting and family life? Well, you already know that we're both proud parents. <laughs> I consider that an essential part of our own lived experience. Um, but the fact of the matter is recovery occurs in the context of family life. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, in our work, we, we don't define family. Actually, the people we work with 
um, define family however they choose. Uh, in whatever constellation or combination of people they choose who are important to them. We also work with parents across the lifespan, parents of toddlers as well as 80-year-old parents of 50-year-old of children. And we work with people who are thinking about becoming parents and who are thinking about whether and in what ways their mental health condition may have an impact on the choices they make. Family provides motivation for change. Parenting also provides lots of opportunities for community participation. But most importantly, in our experience, not considering parenting and family life can actually undermine a person's recovery and ultimately have negative effects on both the parent and the child. We're going to start off our presentation today with a wonderful video um, that the group at Mass General has made. And Anne, tell us a little bit about how that video was developed. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I'm working with six peer consultants that come from uh, very diverse backgrounds with very different expertise and community connections. Um, we actually have people of color, people from the Latinx community. We have non-custodial parents, custodial parents, and moms and dads. Um, and they are certified peer specialists or recovery coaches. Um, and these six consultants designed and implemented uh, 18 listening groups across the state of Massachusetts to help identify community needs and priorities among uh, people with lived experience. Now, many of the topics that came up from these, this listening group pro project uh, were issues such as stigma, loneliness, um, access to peer support services. And taking some of these broad areas and coupling with the uh, um, peer consultants passion and lived experience around parenting, um, we decided to develop a parenting video that would give voice to parents with mental health and substance use issues. And on our team, there's um, almost all of us are parents. So it was real, it was out of a real passion and dedication that this uh, video came about. I really appreciate that, Anne. And, you know, I just want to point out that even if some of us might not be parents, we probably all had parents. And so, <laughs> frankly, the lived experience of family life is something probably that all of us share. But let's turn now to uh, the parents and their video. I'm Ann Whitman on behalf of the Center of Excellence of Psychosocial and Systemic Research at Mass General Hospital. We've created a video for parents with mental health and substance use challenges and their providers. We want to raise awareness, reduce stigma and isolation, and improve the lives of parents and their children. We now invite you to explore our stories. Thank you. So my name is Beth Stark. I am 40 years old. I have a four and a half year old son named Phila, and he is. I'm Ann Whitman on behalf of the Center of Excellence of Psychosocial and Systemic Research at Mass General Hospital. We've created a video for parents with mental health and substance use challenges and their providers. We want to raise awareness, reduce stigma and isolation, and improve the lives of parents and their children. We now invite you to explore our stories. Thank you. So my name is Beth Stark. I am 40 years old. I have a four and a half year old son named Philip, and he is wonderful. My mental health issues probably popped up in my late teens and kind of came to a head after I had my son at age 36. It was at that point that I was eventually given the diagnosis of having postpartum depression, bipolar disorder, and I was in the throes of alcoholism. When we found out we were pregnant, I was over the moon. I elated. I had my son, and about seven weeks after having him, the postpartum kicked in. And at that same point, I started drinking again. And it was during that time that I felt I lost complete control over who I was becoming. 
I have three children. I have two with mental health issues. My substance use and my mental illness affected my parenting style tremendously. So my children had to fend for their own as far as fixing themselves something to eat, washing their own clothes, and taking care of themselves. In the early years, my relationship was very strained with my children. Um, they did not trust me. And it came a time when my daughter became the parent and she ended up taking care of me once I became very mentally incapacitated at one time. I tried to keep my illness out of my parenting and not pulling my kids into my illness. That said, it definitely has affected my parenting. I started to suffer from intrusive thoughts. They became so bad that I couldn't interact with the kids at all for a while. So I just totally withdrew. Um, I'm a single mom. I raised my daughter. She's now 35 and she's really the star of my life. When I got sick, everything kind of fell apart. I lost my home, my doctoral program, and my job. I had to give my child to my parents for two and a half years. It was a, a stressful time, uh, but my daughter seemed to do okay because she could hold on to the fact that I was gonna see her every weekend. And I'd go through my mental health program, day treatment programs. As time passed, I was able to tell her that I was having a hard time thinking and feeling. Okay, I'm Ann Whitman. I have a 35-year-old daughter, and I've been in recovery from mental health and substance misuse challenges for over 30 years. Well, at the age of 33, I had just given up um, nursing my baby daughter, and I began to feel that my office was under electronic surveillance. Within a year, I'd been fired from my job. I'd uh, lost custody of my daughter, and most of my friends had given up calling me, and I was embroiled in a bitter divorce. I felt a tremendous amount of shame and loss, and I began to decompensate. I didn't know who to tell that I had a problem. I was a brand new mom. Who do you go tell that you think your drinking is scaring you? So I went to a support group. No one was saying, I am drinking too much. My mood feels strange. I don't feel like myself. And so eventually I stopped going. Then the labels came out. Bad mom, you obviously don't love your son. How could you ruin everything like that? So you're feeling already terrible about yourself because you realize you have a lot of problems that you have to sort through. And everybody just thinks you're a bad mom. I know now that I wasn't a bad mom. I was a sick mom that needed help. And there's a big difference between the two. Stigma was really difficult around the mental health challenges. In my community, a lot is not understood about mental health recovery. And in fact, it got so bad, like when after I'd gone through that experience of what other people thought about me, I felt judged, I felt less than, I really felt hopeless. I just thought I'd never have another happy day. So that stigma, it almost took me out. That self-stigma and how other people responded to me. You know, everybody was focusing on what's wrong with me, not what's strong with me. And I think what's helped, though, is by overcoming that and getting that peer support of being able to connect with other people going through similar stuff, it gave me strength. So, so the parents of these children that were her friends were kind of like, you know, who are you? They might not have known what my issues were, but there was that, you know, alienation. I told one of the children's mothers one day that I had some issues. She got so scared. I could see it on her face and she grabbed her children and brought them in like I was gonna hurt her children and I, I would never hurt a child. She just totally didn't understand. That I felt was an inability on her part to see the real feelings that we have. I was told that I couldn't talk to my daughter for six weeks while I was inpatient. They felt I needed to focus on my recovery and I felt a certain amount of stigma not being able to talk to my daughter and I could have used an advocate to help with communication. Other ways that I felt stigma was a tremendous amount of self-stigma. Uh, I was very shameful and I, my daughter had a birthday and it was during her time with her dad. And so I felt I couldn't give her a birthday party because she'd already had one with her dad and I was the non-custodial parent. But I was attending a group called Mothers Without Custody, which was a community organization. 
and um, they convinced me that I could have a birthday party being a non-custodial parent. I was really that shut down. And so my daughter's favorite color was purple, and I threw her a purple birthday party. We had purple balloons, purple cakes, and it's one of the um, things that she remembers most. My coworkers would say, oh, she's crazy, or she doesn't have the elevator going all the way up, and little comments that were very stigmatizing, like people with mental illness were not smart, or were not normal. It was just a big stigma of being a parent with mental health issues and substance use abuse disorder. Uh, there were a few folks who stopped talking to me. It seemed like it was more a loss of respect. There were folks where it just seemed a little overly uh, sympathetic, like I was less. What I did though to, to try and overcome it was ignore it and to really try and focus on what I needed to do with the kids. It's difficult to say to him anything in regards to like my substance abuse or my mental health. He knows I do not drink alcohol. He knows I drink Diet Coke, iced coffee, and seltzer water. He knows that I go to meetings. He knows Mommy's talking doctor is very important to her, and he knows I take medication. We will have the conversation with him when he's older, but other than that, he's, there's not too, too much we've shared yet because he's small. And one of the things that is really helpful is how important it is for me to self-assess with my interactions with them. You know, I try to ask questions, how are you feeling? And then to validate his feeling and appreciate him sharing it with me. And I share little snippets of how I've had to deal with challenges, that it's okay to, to feel your feelings and that he can deal with them. He also knows that his mother and I are both in addiction, mental health, and trauma recovery, and he knows that we don't drink or use other drugs. So we talk about this stuff, we're open about it, and I've taken him to AA meetings in the community. That's one of my supports. He knows about recovery. I think we were both so traumatized that we could not talk about feelings or issues and um, really did not do that. I think we could have used uh, some family therapy to help us talk about the emotions and process some of what was going on. Um, in the beginning, it was very, very hard, a relationship with my children, but today it's a lot, lot better. What helped us was doing family counseling. By doing family counseling, we were able to talk to each other about things that we couldn't talk to each other without a therapist there. We were able to get out a lot of things that were bothering us that we didn't know. For example, I would always yell at my children. I never really talked to them. Well, out of family therapy, I started talking more, treating them more with respect, not swearing as much. So those were successes that I've gotten through the therapy of how to talk to my children. We're getting along so much better today now that we know about our diagnosis and now that we know how to take care of ourselves, we're able to take care of each other. You know, as a, as, as a person with a serious mental illness, you have a burden to carry, and so it really makes sense to have someone helping you carry that burden. The biggest support has been my family, especially uh, my parents. Without them, I would not be here. They uh, had been with me since day one. When they realized that they could not reason with me, they just learned everything they could about my illness and they were ready to be there when I was ready to have them there. It's really important to have someone there in your corner all the time. The supports I had when I first started getting sick were professional supports. I had a psychiatrist and she was really supportive. She believed in me. I had my family. I got a psychologist that I started working with. That was the difference of my whole life. You know, while that was very informative, it wasn't as important as the relationships that I built with people. I can see that the relationships are so important for people. Talking with each other is really important and just being able to share. So it was peer support which really, you know, made the difference.
I have a ton of family support, which has helped me develop faith. Also, exercise is, is a huge support. Um, I have a wellness recovery action plan, which I have a game plan on what I got to do to be well, to look at, uh, you know, what I got to do to be well on a daily base, basis. You know, what do I got to leave in my life? What do I got to leave out? Um, I'm a member of a, a gym community. I've been going to the same gym for over 10 years. So there's a community of people and uh, there's people in recovery there and there's people that I work out with. So that culture of uh, that community uh, at the gym is uh, a big part of my recovery. There's recovery support centers that are all throughout the state and uh, recovery learning communities as well. So peer support is a huge support. I got a lot of help from the school. They made me the class parent, which helped me overcome some of the stigma that the other parents felt towards me. They um, had not let Wren come play at my house uh, when I was in early sobriety, and as I became a class parent, they got more used to me and uh, loosened up a little bit. They also put on a, a forum of parents in recovery, uh, talking about their recovery at the school, and that made me feel uh, less alone and less shameful, and so that was uh, very helpful. As I developed new therapists and got further along in recovery, I was able to discuss every aspect of parenting, and they were very helpful. In the beginning, though, I was uh, too afraid to really bring up the issues because I was afraid I would lose custody or that I would lose time with my child. Some resources that I know of now would be Horizons for the Homeless Children Centers, the DMH Wraparound Services for Parents, and the DMH Parent Program. I was not able to talk about parenting with my mental health providers, most likely because my children were already big by now. So they didn't feel the need to talk to me about parenting since I didn't have young children. My children were older. So I never actually got to talk about parenting and um, parenting styles and things like that with my therapist. I was lucky enough and I met my now psychiatrist and my now therapist and they believed in me more than anything in the world. There was never a point where they just were not literally always in my corner, they still are. Just in their belief in me that I could do it and I could do it well and they would walk me through my shame and walk me through my pain and have me talk about my pain. I started to use uh, social media. I also used other recovery blogs and I would follow what people wrote and I, you know, see someone write that they had lost everything too and I was like, okay, I'm not alone. And so I used uh, reading as a strong tool. This is my brave, um, a few different um, recovery happy hour podcasts. And I really started to just try to open myself up to all the different ways there are to recover. Well, I uh, encourage people to uh, feel their feelings, uh, deal with their feelings, and to uh, heal from uh, <laughs> the things that happen to them, and to know in their heart and mind that recovery is real. There's help out there. You will be successful. Don't give up. Continue to talk about things that bother you. Continue to th talk about things that you like. You are not alone. There's a lot of us out here that's doing this. My experience has been that, you know, you can come back from an illness, you can be great, loving parents, have a terrific time uh, with your kids. It, it doesn't have to end your, your relationship in, in any way. Just keep trying and uh, looking for support, uh, natural resources in your community, um, talk to your therapist, talk to your friends, and, you know, I came from a very dark place, and I have a good relationship with my daughter. I did get custody back. It is a struggle, but you can make it through and be a successful parent. The best reward of all of this is I hope another mother sees this, because I know that I, I needed more moms in my shoes. Life gets so much better, and my son is just walking through for that. I didn't know that I'd ever get any of that back. I really didn't. If you work hard enough and you believe in yourself, I think that we can all get the life that we deserve. Anne, <laughs> I just, first of all, want to say thank you to the parents who participated in the video project. I think it's just really beautiful. Um, 
And I'm really humbled by their willingness to share their stories and your story, of course. Um, I'm wondering if you want to take this opportunity to make a few comments about some of these key issues that were raised in the video. Um, yeah, well, obviously you can see from many people in the video that the stigma and attitude of other parents uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, almost all of us encountered stigma from other parents and it's important to help parents um, get over this stigma and to help um, parents who do not have mental health challenges to reach out and examine their beliefs. Um, Cause it's a, a terrible thing when your child gets isolated and can't go play at someone else's house, um, you know, because of the stigma involved with mental health issues. Um, you know, social isolation uh, for everyone is, is uh, very difficult. I spent a lot of time alone in my house before I ended up uh, reaching out. Um, we need to bring more people in to break this isolation. Um, Joanne, maybe you want to talk about the needs of children in diverse ages and challenges. Well, sure. I also, don't let me forget to ask you about the assumptions people make. But I, I think that um, what's a really nice thing about the parents in the video is that they represent parents of children of different ages. And what was pointed to me was when, um, is her name Nora? Norma? Nor Norma. Norma, when she was talking about the fact that her provider never asked her about her children because her children were older. And um, I don't know about you, Anne, but <laughs> I, I, I sort of feel like parenthood is a lifetime uh, career path, if you're lucky. And um, we have worked with, together with many parents of adult children, um, as I said before, parents who are 80 years old, whose children are 50 or 60, who, whose children play a very important part in their lives or not, their absence may have a profound impact on the life of the parent, regardless of the age of the parent. And so um, I really think that we need to think about this parenting business as a, as a lifelong, uh, uh, an entire life cycle pursuit with lots of opportunities to intervene, to provide support. Um, children, yeah. their needs change, their age, as, you know, as they develop and age, the way you talk to them changes. Um, I, you know, which brings us to the topic of communicating about difficult topics actually, and sort of how you talk with children about um, your situation. I also, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, I agree with you about um, communicating about different difficult topics. Uh, people needed a lot of support around that. And, um, you know, I was not one of the best about communicating around difficult topics, but uh, now we do communicate a lot. Um, and actually in the life stages, I found one of the most difficult things as my daughter aged was helping her and myself deal with mutual trauma. And we had, you know, quite a lot of uh, sessions where we just cried together about the trauma that we'd been through, but that was necessary to help us get through it. So I think, you know, it's a lifelong issue and um, there's different topics and different things at uh, various stages. Exactly, exactly. But you know, not to be overwhelmed because the fact that it's a lifelong issue means that you have lots of opportunities to work through things again and again. And I, I know you and your own story talk a lot about issues of separations from your daughter and loss, um, maybe birthdays you weren't able to attend or things that you, that didn't happen the way that you wanted them to happen. And I, I can imagine that those were traumatizing uh, for both you and your daughter. And so to provide opportunity to be able to share that, that's one of those maybe difficult topics that you've communicated about that um, actually um, is a benefit now. Yeah. But let's go on because I want to talk a little bit about um, 
Well, we've talked about the issue of isolation, and you've talked about that quite poignantly. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about peer supports. Several parents in the video talked about the benefit of knowing, well, that you're not alone. I guess that's part of, of um, working with that isolation piece. But um, say a few words well, about peer, peer, peer supports. supports were really important to me. They helped me um, overcome stigma, get parenting tips. Um, and I also ended up joining the Bipolar Support Alliance um, in Boston. And there was a group of parents there and we planned outings together and had whole families oh, nice. come. And that was uh, really nice because it kind of normalized the relationship for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't say more about peer support and many parents in the video, um, Scott and Sandy and, um, they all talk about, um, you know, how important supports were. Um, I think going on to another topic, I attended concurrently, AA had concurrent meetings of pre-Alateen, Al-Anon, and AA. And my ex-husband went to Al-Anon, my daughter went to pre-Alateen, and I went to AA all at the same time, which afterwards gave us a forum for talking about some of these issues. Um, they also were very helpful in terms of giving me resources. I learned about mothers without custody. I got a child therapist for my daughter. Um, so I, I can't say more for the importance of uh, peer support. And, right. Oh, sorry. Um, I think we can also talk about what we can do to make peer supports more available. Um, exactly. One of the one of the things we want to do with this video is to be a catalyst for change, and we want to begin the conversation um, about parenting. And I think we can lobby with the legislature, the Department of Mental Health, um, to make more peer supports and parent peers uh, available to people. Um, mm -hmm. I also think. Um, you know, finding natural community supports, encouraging peers to find natural community supports. Um, you know, I found uh, one woman who was um, very helpful to me. Do you want me to tell a little bit more about it, Joanne? Or? Sure. Um, well, I, uh, my daughter went to swim camp and I met a, um, another mother who was a single parent who was interested in carpooling. And um, I had some organizational skills. I had some skills in terms of sports and uh, getting trips ready. And she had more of the skills of talking to children. And she happened to be a pediatrician. And I wasn't allowed to travel outside of Massachusetts at that point with my daughter. Um, so when I went with her, we could travel anywhere, which we, <laughs> we did. Um, and we really complemented each other's skills. And um, our daughters are lifelong friends. We're lifelong friends. And this was just a natural community um, support, support person. Right. Yeah. And when I talk to her now, I mean, she, one of the things she says is that she got uh, interested in me also from a social justice point of view, that she thought I was being treated so badly in the court system. Uh, that she felt she needed to be an advocate. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. You know, one, another, another thing that people in the video talk about that you have talked about as well is the fact that a peer can role model success. Um, that to see someone else who has lived through what you've lived through, but who has gotten to the other side, or <laughs> there are some great quotes in the video about um, you can do it, you know, uh, I think you yourself said that. Yeah. Uh, keep trying um, because um, it is possible and peers in fact many times offer suggestions for ways of coping but also serve as role models for putting those ways of coping into practice. I wanted to talk a little bit briefly about this issue of who is a peer. You managed to find another mother. Um, do you think 
what, what about this issue of fit? Who, who is a peer in your situation? Is it, were you peer, peers with her because you were both single mothers? Or do you I think, think it was because we were both uh, single mothers um, that had daughters around the same age with similar kinds of interests. But I think one of the things that came up in our listening groups was that people um, wanted services that were more, or people that were more culturally sensitive and coming from their cultural background. Um, yeah. And that we needed to have a more diverse um, group of providers uh, to fulfill this need. Um, so that's an issue of fit of, uh, that Absolutely. Came, came up in our listening groups. Absolutely. Um, oh, well, something that came up in the videos that I wanted to talk a little bit about, because this is um, a piece of the work that we've been doing at our center at Brandeis. Um, and several of the parents in the video talked about uh, some practitioners being supportive and encouraging and others with whom they didn't even talk about their parenting circumstances. And so I'm wondering what you might have to say about why, what's up with having these conversations with practitioners? Um, well, I think uh, reviewing my first and second therapist for you will give you an idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, my first therapist did not begin the conversations about parenting. She never really brought it up. She was more interested in symptom management mm -hmm. uh, than treating me as a whole person. Um, and she did, I could tell, carry a stigma herself um, about parenting with mental health challenges. Um, my second therapist began the conversation about parenting right away. She talked about some low key issues and problems, which, and eventually we got into more complex issues. Um, she treated me as a whole person and my symptoms really didn't come up. The other thing that she did that was very helpful um, for me was that she shared a little bit of her parenting struggles herself and that encouraged me to open up. Um, so, you know, well, those are some, yeah. Yeah. some ideas you might want to comment on, Joanne. I do. Um, and also, <laughs> Uh, it had a bit to do with where I was in my recovery. Um, at first, I really um, was afraid if I talked too much about parenting that I would lose a visitation with my daughter. Um, later on in my recovery, I was uh, more comfortable talking. I appreciate so. that. Yeah, you know, we've, we've done some research at Brandeis about this, and I, I can tell you what practitioners tell us. We've actually talked with lots of providers. Um, and these are some of the common things they say, you know, uh, if I talk about parenting, that must mean that I have to talk about your children and I'm not trained to talk about your children or I'm not a parent myself or not my job or we already do it or it can make the practitioner anxious. You know, it makes me too anxious. You might get upset. You might cry um, or alternatively, you know, in my work with my client, person served, um, apologies for language, but um, we just seem to move from one crisis to the next. We're just putting out fires. We're not doing prospective work about what would you like to have happen or how would you like things to be. Um, there's also, I think for a lot of practitioners, well, they claim this anyways, that there's no time to have the conversation, that uh, if you're an adult, an adult mental health provider who is focused on symptom management or some of the other um, issues that adults often have are challenged by, you know, housing, employment, whatever, there's just no time to talk about parenting, that these parenting goals don't fit into their forms, that they're as providers, they're not familiar with community resources. And um, if you ask about the problem of parenting, then you might have to do something about it. And so in Massachusetts, we had opportunity with huge support from our own Department of Mental Health 
to think together about, well, to set an agenda because our commissioner and our department are committed to um, thinking about whole people uh, as you, uh, the, you know, to use the phrase that you use, to think about people not recovering in a vacuum, but in the context of their lives. And so we've um, actually had long conversations about how do you begin this conversation? Are there evidence-based practices that um, practitioners should be taught to do? Which practitioners, what settings? Um, it became an issue of, frankly, overcoming practitioners' challenges to make every effort to draw from skills they already had, to find a model or an approach that fit into their workflow. Because if you ask a practitioner to do something in addition, it will never happen. Um, to engage them around their motivation to help the parent, um, to provide the training or coaching that's needed. And actually in a lot of our agencies to engage the leadership in overtly committing themselves to this agenda because it requires an organizational commitment at a community agency um, or in an inpatient unit um, to address and promote uh, family life experiences. What we did was come up with a practice approach, uh, which we call the Parenting Well Practice Approach. Um, we recognize that what happens with parents has an impact on children and what happens with children has an impact on parents. And our goal was to make parenting and family life a routine part of every conversation for parents of any age with children of any age. And so we wanted to come up with an approach that fit all the boxes, checked off all, all the items and made it easy for practitioners to talk about these issues with, um, with people who were parents or who were thinking about being parents. This is our Parenting Well Practice Profile, which is available um, on our website as well as at the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health website. Um, this was built with parents, by parents, for parents, uh, as well as practitioners. These four underlying principles were really important across the board. And you talked before about cultural humil humility or being culturally sensitive, the importance of understanding the context of a person's life um, and the strengths they bring to that context, as well as the fact that many of our parents and families have unfortunately experienced, um, had experiences that um, were traumatic. We focused on four core elements um, to help providers think about how to build relationships, to explore with the parent. Um, two things I want to say here, one you mentioned before, practitioners also make assumptions about people who are parents. Um, your neighbors may make assumptions, uh, you know, TV, television shows portray people with mental health conditions. But practitioners also make assumptions about uh, people and their capacity to parent. And so really stepping aside from the assumptions as a provider that you might make to explore with the person sitting with you uh, about where they're at with this whole parenting and family life agenda is really an important thing. And then helping them problem solve and set goals that have meaning to them as parents and that aren't just about symptom management or um, controlling, you know, controlling your symptoms, <laughs> but rather uh, have meaning to you as a person, as a whole person, about the things that are important to you. And then access and advocate. And you had mentioned this, Anne, as well, the importance of um, having an advocate, a person who um, stands with you, who can if they don't know the answer, they can help you find out the answer. And so it's not so much a matter of, if I ask about your challenges as a parent, oh no, well, like who, what, what if I don't know the answer? I think the process that we're trying to uh, implement here is to increase practitioners' capacity to sit with parents and 
um, explore and understand with them what their goals are, and then if they need access to resources or supports, to be able to facilitate that access. Ultimately, our goals in this uh, Parenting Well approach are to reduce stress for parents and to increase hope. And you talk a lot in your work and in your life about hope, and we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. But ultimately, we think that by helping parents do better as parents, by achieving their goals as parents, that they end up feeling better as well. Um, because uh, those feelings of confidence and success um, have a broader impact in your life. So for practitioners, what we tell them is, start talking about parenting like your second provider, your <laughs> second practitioner. Um, talk about it at the pace that the parent wants to talk about it. You made the point that at different stages in your recovery, you were more or less willing or able to talk about these issues. At least open the door to make it acceptable and important to talk about family life, to monitor progress and to celebrate success. Progress happens in baby steps, uh, to adjust the plan, to identify new goals and steps, but to really be with the person who is the parent, um, partnering with them in making plans and achieving goals. So I would ask you in, in these last few minutes before we open up the floor to questions, um, what recommendations do you have about encouraging hope and joy? Um, well, to um, celebrate success, actually I was uh, talking to Sandy who was one of the people in the video and she said every day she made going to bed a joyful experience and they would go <laughs> up. <laughs> I believe it. Uh, and, they would she do that? And, and her daughter would get to jump on the bed for um, oh. certain uh, parts of time. Um, my daughter had some athletic abilities and we celebrated every single sporting event um, that she was part of. And, um, you know, they were really small events, a Saturday soccer game that they might have won or a good team victory. Um, it worked out well for her because she ended up being on the rowing team at uh, Brown University. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, those small successes made into a big one for her. Well, uh, what advice do you have? You know, I've worked with a lot of parents who, particularly if they're depressed, if they're really depressed, or have been through a number of what they perceive as failures, um, failed relationships or partnerships, or maybe they've lost a job. How, like, what, I, I've had the experience of working with parents, sitting with parents who were absolutely unable to identify one thing they did well, one strength that they had. And I know Scott talked about, look at what's strong and not what's wrong. What advice do you have for a parent who's in that dark place? You talked about the dark place. Um, to try to begin to identify strength, to begin to identify success? Um, well, I think just to begin small, you know, what was a success for today? You got dinner on the table. At one point, that was a huge success for me was to be able to get dinner on the table. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, and I didn't do it perfectly. I, I went out and bought a cooked chicken, but then I put some, uh, you know, baked potato in the microwave and some of the asparagus. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to celebrate that, to celebrate um, with some other um, parents, and also my therapist was so helpful, um, not only about um, parenting and stuff, but. I was filling out a dating application and, oh. and she gave me stuff to put in it. <laughs> and she said, you're the most trustworthy person I've ever met. So after that, I went around thinking I was trustworthy and I could be trustworthy with my daughter. And um, so just being really direct about, you know, what a parent's strengths are to 
to point it out to them, to verbalize it, to help them uh, see it, and then help them see in areas where they need to grow. Um, exactly. And then to find the resources to help them grow in, in that area. Uh, my therapists were extremely helpful in, um, you know, taking opportunities to give me feedback. And believe me, I wasn't perfect, but, um, it's you know, a process. Got, yes. It's a process. Yes. I think for some parents, it's really hard to remember, uh, hard to identify, but then hard to remember. And so I've actually worked with, with parents where I've had them, uh, you know, write down on a file, on a file card or a sticky, uh, three things that you, you thought you did well that day. And I didn't, I didn't care if it was, you know, got my child to brush his teeth. Lord knows that could be a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Or, you know, helped my child with his homework or got dinner on the table or got up. I was able to get up this morning and fix my child a bowl of cereal. I mean, we are not talking about, you know, we're talking about the little things, the little, the little things that make up the day of a parent and a child. And sometimes they're very small and sometimes they're very mundane. Um, but as you point out, the ability to put dinner on the table with some thought about maybe there should be a protein and a vegetable. <laughs> um, that's a remarkable accomplishment, frankly, for many parents, regardless of their mental health challenges. So good for you, Ann Whitman. Um, I also want to talk a little bit to some of the non-custodial parents. Just mm -hmm having a video chat or writing a card to your right. child. Um, think of the many ways you can communicate with them where you, you're not necessarily present in the household. Exactly. Um, and be innovative, send them a piece of artwork or um, do, some, do a, a photo album for them. Exactly. I mean, frankly, I know some parents who text message their kids in the upstairs bedroom from the downstairs living room. <laughs> so there are so many ways to stay connected or to build connections um, that don't involve in-person contact 24 seven. And that's really important advice, and I'm glad you raised that because um, so many of the folks we work with either um, by choice or through unfortunate circumstances, have separations from their children and, and maintaining those relationships is really important. Yeah, it is. So thanks for bringing that up. I um, wanted to end the formal part of our webinar today by quoting from Bruce Springsteen, my personal favorite social justice hero. You mentioned social justice before, but um, you know, Bruce, himself has a lifelong major depression uh, challenge and his father was a dad who lived with schizophrenia and and he writes incredibly articulately about recovery and about family life and so um, sometimes our inspirations can come from places we didn't really expect so the next time that you hear dancing in the dark and i want you to know <laughs> that his dark place might have been the same as your dark place in yeah. that moment that you described earlier on. So I think we can go on to say thank you to our incredible cast of colleagues uh, and friends at our yeah, center. Particularly to the um, community-based participatory research team and exactly. um, all the uh, peer consultants and uh, I wanted also to single out Hannah Skees, who is our clinical research coordinator. Um, yes. Who helped us with the um, editing of the video. Yes. We coded a lot. Yeah. Exactly. And then I, our contact information, which is at the end of this uh, presentation and will be available on the foundation website. And then um, I'm happy to open it up to questions or comments or suggestions or recommendations. And I think, Emily, you've been keeping track of those. Um, yes, I have been. 
Um, so I want to say thank you for this really informative lecture. I know that this has been really valuable to our community. Um, so if you have any questions, we only have a bit of time, so we'll probably just get to one or two. Um, but if you do have any, put them in the chat, Facebook Live, and I'll collect them all. Um, and I can always, if you send me an email, email at info at ibpf.org if we don't get a chance to answer them in this, um, we can, I can answer them as well, forward them along afterwards. Um, so I think that this is a really important and valuable question. This individual has had um, suicidal thoughts during a period of severe depression. Their kids know that, they're that they have bipolar disorder. Um, they're 11, 13, and 15. However, um, they've never told them about suicidal thoughts because this individual is afraid to scare them or give them unnecessary stress. But they still think that it's an important thing um, to happen because it is a thought that occurs. Um, so how can this person broach that topic with their kid or kids? I can dive into that, Anne, if, if okay. okay. Um, I, I, let me, I would just first say that these conversations are best had when people are feeling well and not when people are feeling um, depleted or um, actively suicidal. And so I would encourage this parent to, um, when they decide to have this conversation, to do it at a time that's not stressful um, or dark. And I think, Anne, you might, I, I think you're probably gonna talk about kids of different ages and, and how to have the um, conversation, so. Well, I think it depends upon the age. I think when you get up into the 11, 12, 15, 17, um, it's okay for them to know um, and to form a real relationship with you as to what's going on with you. Um, I also think it's important uh, for them to have knowledge of uh, these thoughts in protecting the moms, their, themselves. Um, were they to have the thoughts, um, they would at least know about a family history or um, that it wasn't something totally unusual. Right. I think that you, I think it's important um, for parents to be able, if they can, to role model, um, again, role model success, but role model help seeking. And something that we've done with parents is have them with, depending upon the age of their child, but if the child is old enough to sit and talk about, okay, sometimes mom doesn't feel very well. This is what I look like when I don't feel well. Uh, this is what I look like when I do feel well. When I don't feel well, I have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning or I can't fix your breakfast or I'm crying all the time in my bedroom with the door closed. Who can you call to let know when I'm not feeling well? Who can you turn to as a child to help the child begin to build a natural support network? So can you call grandma um, or Uncle Charlie, or your dad, or your older brother, or, or, you know, to begin to help the child and the mother have the conversation, or father, um, have the conversation about what it looks like when things are going well, when things are not going well, and how to mobilize your supports when things are not going well. Um, and I think this be can all be uh, written down in a tool called the Wellness Action uh, Recovery yeah. Plan. The if you take plan. a parenting approach to that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or you can put a note on the refrigerator. I mean, we have, we've encouraged people to, again, depending upon the age of the child, um, but to do, it, to do it prospectively and to do it in a time when you have some energy to do it. Um, hopefully... It doesn't have to have, the conversation doesn't have to happen when you are really down and out, but when you have some energy to help your child understand. Again, and when your child is not in a stressful um, Exactly. Period. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. And when they're old enough to understand, but frankly, even a five-year-old can tell whether you're getting up to make breakfast or not. And so you might have to say, oh, to your five-year-old, 
this is, you know, because I'm feeling suicidal and I think that my office is being under surveillance, <laughs> under surveillance. Um, but you can have the conversation about, I'm not feeling well today. You know, this is what I look like when I'm not feeling well. Why don't you give Nana a call or whatever, the neighbor, the neighbor lady, who, any, someone from your church or faith community um, to begin to build that network of support. Were there other questions, Emily? There were other questions, however, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think that we'll have time okay. um, to address them, but I will collect them um, and I can always get back to them or forward them along to you. Super. Um, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much, um, Dr. Nicholson and Dr. Whitman for joining us today and for presenting this informative lecture and for showing the video. We got some great feedback that the video was really wonderful to listen to and, and to funny. listen to other perspectives. Um, this webinar recording will be available on our website and our YouTube channel, as well as already on our Facebook. Um, I invite you all to visit www.ibpf.org to learn more about our upcoming webinars and to stay connected via our monthly news newsletter where this recording will be included. We thank everybody for attending and we wish you all a wonderful week. Bye, you guys. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thanks. Thanks very much.